Hello and welcome to our impressive pharma webinar series. My name is Kathy Key. I'm the President and Chief Operations Officer at WorldTree. And this WorldTree series of programs is really designed to educate and inform our farmers and other lovers of the land and the soil in the best practices for farming trees and in the process farming many, many other different beautiful plants and trees. Um, I was so thrilled that we had as our first guest, Finian Makepeace, who is the, the founder of Kiss the Ground. If you haven't watched it yet, Kiss the Ground's documentary, which is on Netflix, is nothing short of amazing, totally inspiring, based in science and practices that have been known for really hundreds of years, but are really finding um, a new audience because they make sense. And in this webinar, um, Finian, who is a, a total, he, he's just, he's such a great speaker. When Finian explains the science of the soil and the reason why we need really great soil health, it just all falls into place. Um, you're gonna, you're just gonna love love this. I learned so much. I'm sure you're going to learn a ton in listening to it as well. Um, especially for our farmers who have been dealing with things like how do I deal with drought and how do I do deal with weather events and rainfall and hail. Turns out there's a lot you can do just with soil to protect from the extremes of weather. Um, on the webinar, we're joined with uh, also with Elliot Winter, who leads our farmer success team at World Tree. He's an environmental scientist who's worked with our farmers in five different regions, is an expert on the Empress Tree. And Finian, um, Finian shares about the soil sponge, and then Elliot translates that into really practical applications for World Tree's farmers. Uh, this is totally worth your time. I hope you enjoy listening to it as much as I did um, being part of the conversation. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's listen to the webinar. Yeah, I'll try to do a, a quick version because I want to get into the content. <clears throat> um, I've always been an activist, an environmentalist, um, paying attention on, on most fronts, <clears throat> scientifically, et cetera. And, um, I was a touring musician for first 10 years of my 20s and then about 29, uh, I got awakened to soil regeneration, the possibility. And for me, it was so profound because every calculation I had made up until that point of how humans were going to face the challenges that we're currently looking at, whether it's desertification, too much CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, water security, et cetera, uh, nothing really matched the solution. None of the gadgets and gadgets that were being made to suck carbon out of the air or whatnot. And, and nothing was really looking to, to be a solution at that scale. When I learned uh, through a four hour presentation by Graham Sate out of Australia uh, about this potential, this phenomenon of rebuilding soil faster than we ever thought possible, regenerating these landscapes to this scale, it, it clicked. And I had a pretty substantial background of, you know, even doing, speaking of mycorrhizal fungi, studying in Cornell University, I was a 12th grader doing studies on how oak groves were found to be communicating with each other to stop the airborne viruses from transporting all the way to oak groves some 10 miles away. It was through the mycorrhizal colonies under the ground that they were sending these messages. So when I heard this message from Graham Sate, so many things clicked for me and it was quite literally a life-changing moment where I went back to the other co-founder Ryland's house and, and we shook hands basically saying, if this is all true, we have to dedicate our lives to helping spread this message. Therefore, working with the pioneers on the front of this movement, how do we help amplify their message? How are we standing in the position of saying, yes, this is an amazing, the most amazing message in our opinion for the world, but there aren't a lot of people spreading that awareness. So our immediate dedication was, we can actually help do that. We're those type of people and, and that's a gift we have. So we have to use it to its maximum capacity. So that, that day right then and there, we said, we will do this. Again, if this is all true, which 
you know, months of research later, it started to be more and more true and even more amazing. But that was our premise was we have to do all we can to spread this message. So I went from, you know, a dedicated life as a, as a touring musician and activist to someone who was saying this message has to be more available for the world. Fantastic. So uh, I know that um, given everything you've learned since that moment, you could, you could talk for probably 24 hours straight just on soil. And today we chose to um, focus on the soil sponge. And I know you have some um, materials to share with us. So I'm going to let you just hand over to you to share with us on the, on the soil sponge and why we should be interested in it. Great. Uh, again, uh, there's so many different ways to start this, but I just want to thank you, Dr. Kathy, Rita, and Elliot. Um, just a bit more context about myself. Uh, speaking to farmers, I always have to make it clear, I am not a farmer, but, and or and, I have had the unbelievable honor and opportunity to work with the farmers and ranchers at the forefront of this movement, whether it's making media at their ranches, uh, interviewing them, getting their insights, uh, how to spread this message to different people, whether it's corporations or, or farmers. Um, so I've been really lucky to get insights and progressions into this movement. And I want to start by one of my favorite quotes to give some context for the momentum around regenerative agriculture from one of my favorite practitioners, Dr. Alan Williams, who's a rancher and a rancher trainer and farmer trainer uh, all over the world. Uh, he says, what used to take us 15 to 20 years, we're now seeing those results in three to four. And what that's really putting significant uh, emphasis on is the evolution of this movement of what farmers and ranchers are able to do with context, with principles and practices being amended and, and looked at of how can we supercharge regeneration with using less and less inputs and the results are sometimes out of this world extraordinary, whether it's uh, infiltration rates of, of water, whether it's carbon storage, whether it's biodiversity increases, uh, it's, it's phenomenal. And I'm sure Elliot and others on this call who've been to some of these places just can, can attest that it's, it's beyond unbelievable what's able to happen in a two to three year period now uh, with advancements in how these ranchers are and farmers are doing these practices. So I'm so excited about this movement and more people getting on. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Let's see, uh, there we go. And if you all can see this, we're just gonna jump into a section of uh, soil advocate training curriculum. Um, so we don't have time to get into it all the background, but a lot of what I present to people is how they can also spread this message. So how can farmers start to talk to other farmers, uh, whether it's the government they wanna start talking to about supporting them, local, state, et cetera. This is about how are we starting to make some of these differentials. So this slide is really easy to start to grasp. Soil is soil because there is soil organic matter or living or once living components in there. It's not just sand, silt, and clay. It it's actually has uh, organic material in there. When we don't have living plants in the ground, we're dealing with net carbon loss. That means decomposition, oxidization, et cetera, are going on to such an extent that there's more carbon going into the atmosphere from the living soil, those organisms trying to eat, they're consuming things, they're decomposing things, putting them into the air, versus a system where you are working with plants. We didn't have time to do this in the beginning, but reminder that the carbon that makes its way into soil, most of the valuable carbon, the shift that's happened over the last several years is thinking, oh, the most of the carbon that makes it into the soil is because organisms and leaves and uh, dead animals, et cetera, are decomposing at the surface and mixing with sand, silt, and clay. That's a fraction of it. The majority of the good carbon is because plant roots are exuding carbon sugars, leaking them out to feed the fungi and bacteria and other organisms in the soil food web that are helping the plant access minerals and water, et cetera. So this carbon pump, 
was mostly left out of soil science for the past 100 plus years. And his last 30 years is finally getting inclusion. But what we're seeing, therefore, is that living plants, green photosynthesizing plants, are pumping carbon into the ground. Oftentimes that means more biology in the soil, which is actually producing more CO2. But nature figured out that problem. It's called how plants are designed to actually capture the CO2, not all of it, some of the CO2 that's leaving from decomposition, the leaves are able to take that back up, create carbohydrates or glucose, and then pump more of that down into the soil, creating these aggregates, which we'll see in a second. So this phenomenon of a potential net carbon gain is so crucial to understanding how rebuilding the soil sponge is possible and how water follows carbon. So this is just a, a basic premise that if we don't have living plants, even if you have mulch, for example, you're still dealing with a net carbon loss because you don't have living plants doing exudates into the ground, exuding liquid carbon uh, that they create from photosynthesis. So we want it to be clear that this is carbon rich soil. When you're seeing aggregated soil like this, you're dealing with the phenomenon of, of carbon rich soil. So just one, one quick anecdote on this. I don't think it's in the next slide. So just wanted to mention when a plant on average, grasses, plants, et cetera, on average are leaking out 30 to 40% of the glucose or carbohydrates, later become carbohydrates, molecules that they create through photosynthesis, 30 to 40%. That's a huge amount of liquid carbon that's being exuded out of their roots to feed the organisms. Bacteria are creating gluey substances for fungi, it's, it's their glomalin, which we could talk about forever but they're creating gluey substances that are essentially sticking soil particles together and creating these carbon glued aggregates. Because again, the plant shared carbon sugars to the organisms in the soil. They grow and they create gluey substances. Those gluey substances are made of carbon and they create carbon glued aggregates. We also refer to these as carbon glued super sponges. You might want to write this down. Uh, a properly formed humus or uh, a carbon glued aggregate like this can hold 20 times its weight in water. 20 times its weight in water. So that's an extreme super sponge that nature evolved to create very purposefully so that when it rains, we're maximizing rainfall maybe it being we need to make sure that the the potential when it rains we're maximizing how much can be absorbed and retained for plants to use so this includes this carbon in there that's the the glues ex exudates glomalin and and more and more lots of different uh things even even the gluey substances that a worm uh, exposes from its body are helping to bind soil particles together so from the bacteria all the way up to things as big as, as, as worms. So this is another just poignant example of when we're talking about the power of structuring soil. So why I emphasize this so much in, in our lectures is that we need to help ourselves and the world start to differentiate, differentiate between dirt and soil, but more importantly, properly structured soil because just having organic matter in your soil, like a compost pile is great, but a compost pile is still vulnerable to wind and water erosion. If I had more time today, I would take that aggregate you see in the picture, the soil aggregate, I would plop it in the water here and you would watch it hold its shape for days. These are glues that allow water to absorb in but don't explode. If I took a clod uh, from a tilled field that you'll see, and I put that into the water, it would initially explode. This is called a slake test. You can go on YouTube and check these out from people like Ray Archuleta. But this is what we're saying is these fundamental differences of structured soil, glued together soil. It's not only holding carbon, but it's the essence of the soil sponge. 
So then so Finn, look, yeah. let's ask you, ask you a question, right? Just stay on that dirt soil one. So, so, so yeah. great. So great. Like our farmers are always talking about the weather. I mean, it's yeah. what we talk about all the time. So last year in Alabama, for example, it, we had like three droughts in a row. This year, Alabama, it's rain, 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 rain. Too much rain. Right? Too much rain, yeah. So <laughs> could you just, could you, could you spell out the difference in, you know, those scenarios if you've got dirt versus soil? A hundred percent. So I'm getting right there. Perfect. To wrap this up is <laughs> maximizing solar energy function. How much carbon from the atmosphere are we turning into sponge material that's our goal on our land how do we maximize how much energy from the sun is actually taking the carbon from the atmosphere and turning it into healthy sponge-like cake-like conditions that the difference of this is shown so we're maximizing the solar energy function utilizing this the this energy from the sun to maximize photosynthesis to maximize how much exudates are happening into the soil to build our sponge. So we're going to jump, it looks like time-wise. Um, so a great question is what happens when soil organic matter changes? This is really to answer Dr. Kathy's question here. What happens when soil organic matter changes? So let's say a pretty unhealthy soil out in California. This is our average soil on the left here, even though we used to be a very rich and amazingly fertile place. We're now dealing with about 1% average soil organic matter on our farmland, which is very, very scary. So what you see here is pretty easy equation. This isn't, don't, don't take these numbers as, as truth. They obviously fluctuate depending on the time of year and many different things, but this is just an example to take a, a, an approach of looking at this. So you have 74% sand, silt, and clay. That's the, the dirt, essentially. Then you have air, 10%, water, 10%, organic, 10%. When we increase our soil organic matter, let's say to 10%, you could be getting a situation where your soil structure changes such that air is able to infiltrate. So you don't have heavy compaction like you do on the left here. And you have water being able to be absorbed, retained and infiltrate. So we are changing the dynamics of that soil system completely. So when we increase the soil organic matter, we have a, a situation where more air, what's the key component of air? What's the biggest component of air, Dr. Kathy? Nitrogen. Nitrogen, yes. So when we don't have nitrogen entering the soil, those, even those uh, aerobic conditions that, that uh, bacteria uh, that use nitrogen to, to fix nitrogen, we don't have access to that. So when we're creating a condition where air can flow into our soil at an rate of 40% air, most people don't think of air and water being a part of soil. They are intrinsically linked to healthy soil systems. So this is just about changing the structure. The analogy here, Dr. Kathy, we use is imagine a stack of bricks before someone builds a, a three-story condo and then imagine a three-story condo. One of them is completely compacted stack of bricks. The other is a structure that has space for air, water flow, electricity, internet wiring, uh, hangout space where people can live, kitchens, food, so the whole nine yards. We are building the soil empire, the soil city, the super matrix underground so that life can thrive, water can flow, air can flow. Life needs water and air. We're making that available when we build soil organic matter. Now, to go to your question around water, here it is on a reflection. When we deal with building that soil sponge, helping it to create itself through maximizing how much uh, liquid sugar is pumped into the ground, we're dealing with uh, one side where we have runoff, and, and this is just some metrics. Please write these down. <clears throat> Dr. Alan Williams has visited and tested hundreds of ranches in Texas. Texas dealt with some major flooding a couple years back. Uh, it wasn't just the paved cities that dealt with flooding. What was happening when you realize that the average infiltration rate on the ranches that he tested, a half an inch of water, see if we can have a guess, Kathy, from the audience, how long did it take on average for a half an inch of rainwater to infiltrate 
on those ranches. How long do you think, guys? Any guesses? We've got four days. Kara's saying four days. Four days. That's a bit, that's a bit long. Someone else, two cement, days. Cement doesn't take more than two hours. But, uh, <laughs> an hour. A half an inch of water. Average infiltration rate of an hour. You get a heavy rain. All you're dealing with on any slope is runoff. And then if you don't have a slope, you're dealing with water sitting at the surface. If you have four inch rain, you have a, a foot, foot of rain, you're just dealing with accumulation and terrible conditions and then a lot of it evaporates. So it's, that's really good. So we're thinking, so comparing it to concrete really hit home for me. It's like this, the one on the left is getting closer and closer to concrete. I mean, it's think? half, it's almost half life of concrete, sometimes worse. Right. And yeah, it can take, it can take, I've been on farms and seen videos, YouTube videos where infiltration doesn't happen for over three hours. That's worse than concrete. So wow. it's literally because this, the, the particles of clay, think of a clay pot. When you have erosion, you have rain hitting your open soil, you're compacting, you're breaking apart soil aggregates and the clay particles rise to the surface. So you end up getting your really teeny fine particles at the top, which end up sealing off your soil even more because of the exposure to rain hitting, hitting that ground. So then you almost have a clay pot happening where clay pots uh -huh. aren't as penetrable as cement is. So that's where we deal with this situation where it can become extremely, extremely vulnerable to water issues. So now when we look at, here's the next guess, three or so years under regenerative grazing management, many of those farms moving from a half an inch in an hour to a half an inch in under 10 seconds. Whoa. When you move, not just one ranch, but an entire region or watershed from a half an inch an hour to a half an inch in under 10 seconds, you have significantly at the macro level shifted how vulnerable downstream flooding and major issues are. Of course, drought as well, because you're rising those water tables when you have infiltration rates that high. So this is why we have to say, this has to be starting to look more than just individual by individual farm and ranch. When can we start to look collectively at watersheds and saying everyone wins if we cover our land more and keep regenerative practices happening so that we're infiltrating. So plan grazing from overgrazing is the difference that can make the difference uh, for that example, that's just one, one example. So to put it into more perspective, we look at the degenerative water cycle versus the regenerative water cycle. So obviously on this, by the way, is about uh, 200 yards, no, uh, a quarter of a mile, I don't, I don't, I don't remember. I, Don Smith, the other teacher who teaches this course with me, took these two pictures on the same exact day, looking at the difference. So here we see degenerative water cycle, this is, quite literally uh, about a quarter mile apart where we're dealing with almost full infiltration, which if a, here, write this one down to an inch of water on an acre, when you get full infiltration, that's 27,000 gallons of water held per acre with one inch of rainfall. So that's incredible. So you're seeing on the right side, it's nearly hundred percent infiltration left side. We're dealing with major runoff. That's not only wrecking the, the perfectly tilled field, but it's also losing that water uh, as well as taking runoff. And the average, another thing to write down, average uh, soil loss in agriculture in the United States from the USDA is four tons per acre per year. That's nearly four pickup trucks filled with topsoil per acre being taken off our land. That's the topsoil, that's the best stuff that is the most absorbent water catching sponge. And we're actually just letting it run off as this picture here shows. So degenerative water cycle means more bare soil, means more evaporation, more runoff, more heat islands, because without plants covering the ground, you're actually radiating more heat. Temperature differentials up of 70 degrees sometimes from covered ground to covered green ground, photosynthesizing ground versus uh, bare, bare soil. Uh, heat island, more droughts, it repeats, it cycles. Regenerative water cycle, more covered, more infiltration, more cooling, because uh, of the water evaporation, transpiration, as well as the uh, ability to take sun's energy, converting it into sugars is an endothermic reaction, meaning it's a cooling process. 
uh, that's occurring. More plant aerosols. Through transpiration, the plants are breathing out um, mini aerosols that hold uh, cloud seeding functions, essentially. So we have more cloud formation. And then because we have less uh, radiant heat, we're actually allowing more cloud formation because of the plant aerosols, as well as uh, cooling. So we have the tendency for cloud formation happen. I'm going 90 miles an hour here, I know that, but when you have major heat island effect for multiple different uh, farms in a row, we've seen in Australia countless examples all over the world where we have uh, uh, cloud patterns coming and then they're either dissipating because of the extreme heat. We know this from heat island effect from cities, but now it's happening in our rangeland and our farmland across the world where our farmland is actually doing the same thing a city does, which is dispersing those clouds, either uh, helping with evaporation from those clouds formation or pushing them away. So pushing them back to sea often is what we deal with. Um, so this is the same day and this is just helpful to see the difference. You know, we have very, very slight infiltration, tons of runoff, tons of evaporation. Here we have a huge amount of uh, uh, infiltration and then we have transpiration occurring on the up cycle through the living plant. That's uh, what we want it to do. We want water to leave through the living plant, not from evaporation. Transpiration. So yeah, so one of the things I'm getting from this spinning is that- I'm, I'm is finished it, here, Kathy. So this is the end is, yeah, here it is, okay. folks. You have the difference between nitrogen going in, oxygen going in, and CO2 going out, or the difference of them all being uh, going into the system. So it, it's such a transformation. Again, um, I could go on and on about this, but everything that, that happens, I'll just do one last thing really quick. Yeah just so we can see, we're just gonna scroll through these. We're not even gonna talk about them, but uh, maybe maybe Elliot can, can talk more. But this is what we're looking at when we're looking at the difference of, uh -huh. watch the H2O, okay? The H2O uh, components here. Tilling, so we have bare soil versus cover crops, tilling versus no till or reduced till. We have chemicals versus reduced chemicals. This, is, this starts to include uh, nitrous oxide emissions increases. Then you have planned grazing versus CAFO systems. We have increase of the, the water sponge. Um, and these are just helpful slides to have people grasp this uh, system. Annuals versus perennials. Obviously annuals are much more, um, you know, going against the principles of regenerative agriculture with, with more uh, intensive cultivation, et cetera. Um, and then you have windbreaks versus no windbreaks, silvopasture, organic in landfills or on rangeland. That's it, folks. That'll be the presentation very fast, but thanks for bearing with me. <laughs> That's amazing. And, uh, you know, one of the things that is really clear to me as you speak is that, that, that natural systems are not, stay, they don't just stay the same. It's not like we can just leave it and it all stays the same. It's either degenerating or regenerating. We're either in a spiral towards- Sustainability is a funny food. one like that. Like when is it actually <laughs> happening? When do we get to stasis? Life doesn't work like that. We've either got dead concrete or we've got a, a sponge that's actually, I love that idea of it being like a living city that has structure and form and yeah. uh, prosperity. And nature, and nature evolved that. itself to ever increase that whenever it has the option. One last thing I want to mention is in uh, what we call brittle environments, where most of the year it is very, 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 very little moisture in the atmosphere, we're dealing with a phenomenon that just conserving land, letting that land back to nature doesn't actually work. Humans now need to go in and, and start managing it regeneratively versus if you were in the Northeast of, of the United States, if you left a field to itself, it'll turn into a forest in 10 years. Great. If you live in, in New Mexico or, or Southern California and you did that, you're on degradation because it's already reached a tipping point of increasing its own degradation if there's no animals included with plant grazing etc so just throwing things to conservation when they're in this brittle state or this degenerated state already unfortunately doesn't work around the world and that's where tree planting combined with regenerative practices is a huge huge part of the of the puzzle so one of the things i know about our farmers is First of all, they love their land and they, will, they know their land better than anyone. And second, they're always looking for practical ways to improve. And when they see results, they'll do more of it. 
Uh, so Elliot, I'm going to hand over to you to translate this into maybe choose like three things our farmers um, farmers can do to put this into practice. First of all, I want to thank uh, thank you, Finn, for for doing that presentation. This is a pro this is a, a subject that I'm I'm very very passionate about, um, and I something that I I really have wrestled with to relate to farmers because as as people that you know that are in uh, as environmentalists or in a movement to be activists you know i consider myself an activist or an environmentalist as well really relating this to farmers and and trying to not have this be like a, a dichotomy of where it's like you can't be an environmentalist and a farmer or something like that and so I think that's exactly where, you know, uh, regenerative agriculture, like what you were talking about, fits in perfectly. I mean, farmers are some of the most connected people to the land. Farmers are on that land every day. And uh, I think that these two things can definitely go together. Um, so I think really from what I took from the presentation um, and just something that I, I, I feel like really goes well with what you're talking about is, um, you know, farmers, uh, healthy soils, you know, benefit farmers. Um, there's be, benefiting the environment isn't just, you know, like you said, leaving it alone and not doing anything with it. Um, having an environmental benefit means that farmers can benefit from this as well. Um, what I see this being is, is, you know, farmers don't have to put as much into their land when they're doing regenerative agriculture. Um, cover crops and, and uh, no-till practices can really do a lot of amazing things for farmers, like um, increase their soil fertility um, and the available nutrients to those plants, which means farmers have to put less money into pesticides, into fertilizer. Uh, you know, uh, the um, improved water retention and, um, and drainage of, of, of the lands Farmers have to deal with less damage to crops from floods that can happen in heavy rains. Um, that means that farmers have to water less as well. Uh, I know a huge amount of costs in places like Eastern Washington is, is, is the use of water. It's very highly regulated, especially in areas you know, of California where water is such a, a, a hot subject. Yeah. Um, and then also the um, the inputs to the land, it's less work for the farmer, you know, the farmer doesn't have to go out there and till the land every year or a couple times a year just to get it so that they can plant and it's not like a concrete block. Um, and I think one of the main things is uh, less damage to the crops from things like evapotranspiration where, you know, the, you have no soil or I mean you have no uh, cover crops or no plants to kind of disperse that heat so you have this evaporation that heats up the plants to uh, levels where they end up having cell damage and they die. And so farmers see a lot of damage and sun scorching and all that stuff from these uh, plants because the, there's, there's no cover crops or anything, other things like that. Um, so I think the three things for me that I really saw where farmers can benefit from this is like, is healthy soils and, and really doing these things that benefit the environment also benefit farmers. Um, cover crops are a huge essential part of that. Um, and finding the right cover crops that can fit you, but also fit the style of farming that you're going to be doing. Is it no-till? Is it mm -hmm. um, something, that, you know, what's, what's the temperature? What is your area? And so I think there's a lot of potential for that. Um, and also just... Elliot. Just, uh, for our farmers, they're probably there, okay, they're getting the, the importance of cover crops. What, what cover crops would you recommend they take a look at? Um, I think there are, there's so many. <laughs> um, I think it, native grasses are always a good one. Um, native grasses, they've, they, they do a, a really good job of, of working with tree, these trees. Um, they don't have super deep root systems, but they can break up that uh, subsoil or that uh, surface soil. Um, they don't compete very heavily with uh, water uh, or nutrients availability. They're in different zones of, of the soil. Um, clover is a good one that you can mix in there. It, um, 
low, uh, low growing um, vines or creeping vines that uh, can help break up the soil and cover a lot of ground or another good one. Um, one of the ones that I have seen uh, is, is a low dense grass, low dense grasses. Um, those can cause some issue by taking up a lot of water. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, some of our farmers have talked about just planting native grasses to kind of, because they're a little bit wider apart, they're not so dense, and you know, they, they're good in that, uh, that top soil. Um, and yeah, I think having, having those on top of any type of, uh, yeah, one, can I add one thing, Elliot, there? Oh, yeah, go ahead. So what we work with the, the Soil Health Academy a lot, and, and they work with a, quite a diversity of, of farmers and ranchers across the U.S. and are probably the most sought after regenerative farmer trainers. And what, what they talk about a lot these days is, is especially context specific. Again, is, is, is this a ranch or are you dealing with uh, cropping systems that you want to have? And what they found time and time again is that depending on the region, the diversity of cover crops that you can integrate in the beginning. Uh, and, and to emphasize what Elliot said is a lot of times people think like, oh, these typical cover crops are what I need. But oftentimes when you're dealing with highly eroded or degraded soil, the grasses are the winner because their rate that they are putting out exudates that are helping for aggregation to cre be created is way more than some of these penetrating ones. You start with those and then the year after you can do some of your deeper penetrating ones. But if you try to start with your deeper penetrating on your essentially clay rock surface that you have, you're gonna be a failing cover crop system. So this is where it's really important to check out your original context, regional context, weather, et cetera, and then start to look at like, okay, wow, am I gonna start with beginning the process of my aggregation? And that's where, again, putting the emphasis oftentimes on grasses, native grasses systems can be the solution. Yeah, a hundred percent. I agree a hundred percent. I think um, that I think the third thing uh, that I, I kind of took from this whole thing is, uh, and just something that uh, is something that we always need to hold on to when we're thinking about farming systems is um, diversity. Uh, having you know in, in our case with our farmers planting uh planting the polonia tree um they're building soil throughout just by planting the tree because those the the leaves that they're dropping i think it can total to 100 pounds of, of leaves a year um, once these trees are mature or even more and um after after 10 years of growth you have you know five inches of, of good topsoil like black topsoil and then you know just combining that with any with like you said a diverse set of of uh, cover crops and not only just you know thinking in the terms of what are the you know the most common grasses are especially native grasses they've been doing it for a while they've uh, they're accustomed to that area and they just they really benefit well in this. Uh, while we're on the subject of cover crops, um, somebody's asked um, whether there's a cover crop that can also act as an income stream for the farmer. Yes, um, graze your own or get someone else to graze. You know, like we have we have situations right now where farmers are three things. Dairies especially are using this model in California. You can grow your cover crop and then have extra left over to sell to other farms for their feed if you do a tasty cover crop and it's simultaneously doing great penetration, uh, root development, as well as soil aggregation. So 100% that, that model and then your own feed for your, your own uh, grazing animals. Uh, and then again, reduced long-term water costs as well when you have the use and absorption when you have a grass system that's creating the sponge you can have what people consider like oh the grass is going to use it all but as Elliot's mentioning if you get the right kind of grasses you're actually keeping cool protection of your soil keeping that hydrated soil surface for quite many months as opposed to what's often evaporated uh, in less than a couple weeks otherwise um yeah, one, uh, I know there's a, there's a lot of, uh, uh, 
a lot of different types of cover crops that you could do to try to create, you know, some, uh, some income to offset some costs. Um, I know some normal ones are like winter cereals, like winter wheat or rye. Um, the other ones like clover, winter pea you can, uh, you can do. But as I, I really like the idea that Finn was talking about um, and that you can grow these trees, you know, and at year three, you can have grazing animals on this property. Um, and you have a system that is you know, regenerating soil, sequestering carbon, and you can put cattle on it, and you get a higher quality feed. Um, there's no cost to the farmer uh, uh, because you're not paying for feed for these animals to, uh, to supplement the grass and everything. So it's more nutrient dense, there's less cost for the farmer, and you're in a system that's supporting itself. And so it's a really win-win-win situation for farmers. And one last thing on that is just to kind of put it into perspective. Regionally, it does vary, but mm -hmm. just to give two examples, the very, very desertified Wahhabi Desert in Mexico, starting with it takes 200 acres to feed one cow, and then in six or so years, moving that to 275 acres to feed one cow. But then in Alabama, starting with 11 or 12 acres to feed one cow, in three years, moving that to one to two acres to feed one cow. That's an increase of biomass production. That's a thriving ecosystem that's not only sequestering or, or absorbing more water, filling aquifers, but also creating the sponge, but also it's technical dollars. Zero input costs year three and uh, the ability to have three and a half times more cattle on the land because of how much biomass was created. That's extraordinary economic argument that everyone needs to start taking seriously. Oh, yeah. And then you oh, add yeah. pasture pork to that and you're talking about some major income revenues because that's a, that's a you know, six piglets to, a, uh, you know, those are, anyway, if you want to talk to me more about those economic models or <laughs> sign up for Soil Health Academy's new online course, by all means, definitely do that. Yeah, I, 100%. I, if, if people, yeah, like you said, strong economic argument, uh, there's, there's no, yeah, you can get more cattle on less land and have them have better feed and and produce more. So yeah, yeah it's, exactly. I, I would recommend anybody uh, to to take that course and to learn about these because it's you're saving money and and you're you know learning a lot that can help you down the line. We have some just have on some. that the the online uh, course from Soil Health Academy yeah. called Regenerative Ag 101 will be available through our website next week. Uh, that's a wait list because the course starts in December. So next week, if you come to kisstheground.com to our farmland place, you'll be able to see the, the advertisement for that uh, Regen 101 coming next week uh, from the Soil Health Academy. Oh, that's awesome. an online course to get you started with. And they start economics, farmer prosperity is first and foremost for them. If this doesn't work economically for you, forget about it. You know, So they're, uh -huh. they're amazing at that. Very good. And we'll make sure that gets posted on our social media as well. And uh, this whole conversation, we have, we actually have a, um, a wonderful cattle farmer in Alabama who's um, um, doing exactly this style of farming. We're hoping to have, um, this is a, a theme for one of our upcoming webinars. And the other thing that's there for me just to, to, to share is, um, you know, we get asked a lot about, you know, why do we plant empress trees so far apart? And, you know, empress trees actually prefer to be further apart, but it does lend itself to these other, you know, being able to intercrop, actually take care of the soil to put um, cattle amongst the trees, um, which you can't do with regular forestry practices, which just squash as many trees as they can um, into an acre. Um, one, one note, I, on, one note yeah. on silvo pasture, meaning using grazing animals and spaced out trees as World Tree is doing, number one carbon sequestration rated, except for uh, what are those trees called in the cypress, not cypress trees, what are those? Carbon sequestration, it's right behind, what am I talking about? What are those trees that are in the water that have the long legs? Oh, the mangroves. Mangroves, mangroves yeah. and silvo pastures. So in terms of, if anyone cares about carbon sequestration, Silvo pasture, which is possible with what World Tree is doing, uh, most number one land management carbon sequestration potential. Awesome. Okay, well, uh, I think we answered the winter cover crop question. Elliot just kind of elegantly did that. Um, any any 
any final questions? Any anything that you want to ask either about what we've talked about or um, from watching the Kiss the Ground documentary, which I'm going to underscore another three times. Watch it. If you haven't watched it, take the time to go and watch it. I'm going to be watching it at least another two or three times myself um, uh, because it just inspires me so much about what's possible for the future and so much detail in there. Um, um, lot, lots of great stuff to forward the conversation. Um, yeah. Any questions? Elliot, did you have something else you wanted to? to oh, I was just going to say, you know, uh, as, as farmers, you know, farmers are stewards of the land. My family grew up uh, with uh, dairy farms and we, this movement is growing, uh, you know, that, that Finn is part of, that we're part of, that, you, you know, it's growing and growing more and more. And so I think things like this, um, if you're interested in it, go do as much research as you can. Um, will any of our farmers, you can always come to us and ask us about any of these programs like, you know, Regen's uh, 101 or anything like that as well. Uh, or anything that if you want us to do, um, you know, some more of these, I think really getting this out there and knowing that you can save money and improve your lands and reduce costs and everything, it, it's so important. And so I, um, I would just stress that farmers, if you're interested, you know, don't let it go, just reach out to us or, or, or just let us know um, what we can do to help you, you know, achieve this. Yeah, and likewise for me. Again, it's an honor to to speak to farmers out there. Um, but again, I'm I am one degree separation. I, I am working my darndest always to represent the cutting edge of what what's being developed and and being given access to that. And it feels amazing to do so. And I'd love to be able to put you all in touch with the direct source uh, of those folks in any way that I can. So uh, let me know if if anyone's interested in in making those connections. One last thing for me is, you know, if people want to start being more uh, a part of advocacy for this, meaning talking to local people, talking to companies, so pitching, you know, hey, I'm already doing this. I'm working with WorldTree and I've been doing this type of uh, regenerative agriculture for 10 years. Why doesn't anyone know about this? Uh, the coarse soil advocate training, I don't want to just like advertise myself here, but what I'm doing is helping you, no matter what your target audience is, develop that argument using slides that I haven't just showed you and much more to say, hey, I'm here to help you to make this pitch, whether it's, okay, we have more market access to some of these new products or okay, now our state policy is actually gonna help me and give me subsidies versus I'm just all on my own. How can we help you uh, be empowered in those conversations? So that's Soil Advocate Training, uh, which is on kisstheground.com, but also now we have next week coming access to Regen 101 for farmer training. And you can get scholarships to our three-year farmer training uh, program at kisstheground.com uh, on our farmland side. If you're interested in longer term, more in depth, uh, the online course, as well as in-person courses from Soil Health Academy uh, and others, we would love to help you with the scholarship into that program, which is worth quite a bit of money and also helps you to, to kind of go through a three-year process so that you're, you're kind of helped and, and have that assistance along the way. Um, yeah, the, any, I just added the deck. I don't know if people can see that I just made a little deck of what I shared with you today. It's not the full deck. Uh, and then I, I think I made a couple other links there, but, uh, I, oh, I put the talking points too. Uh, if people can access that, I believe you should be able to, but those two links, uh, could be good resources to use if you're out there trying to communicate this idea. That's fabulous. I mean, one thing, I mean, we've had a number of our team do the, um, soil advocacy training and, I was struck with that and with the documentary, how generous you are with the information. So it's like the opposite of many it's, organizations. It's not my time. information. I, I'm, I'm the conduit of making it like usable, whatever you want to call it. It's, yeah. But I'm collecting it from the point source, which is these pioneers who are making all these amazing discoveries. So. Yeah, so I highly recommend it that you take a look at that if you want to learn how to talk about these subjects in a way that can communicate clearly to other people and uh, with confidence as well. So it's partly a, a training in the, the, the science, but also a training in, in how to present the material.
All right, guys, that's our time today. Thank you so much um, for this really um, inspiring conversation. Um, uh, and uh, I really get that together we can be part of that positive feedback loop. Um, we can do this. Yeah, I, I want to just add on that. This, this movement is so, to, to kind of echo what, what Kathy was saying, is this movement is unique because the generosity from the leaders is show, setting an example. Uh, whether you email Gabe Brown and he emails you back at three in the morning, you know that this is from the, from the forefront of this movement. These are people who are deeply committed to more people being able to grasp this, achieve it. It's, it's not about hoarding. So there's so much room for so many people to play, especially in, in bigger and bigger roles of helping out. Elliot, it was a divine pleasure to talk with you here today and looking forward to connecting more in the future. Yeah, for sure. I definitely would like to uh, di like to uh, connect and, and see what what we could all do together. And it was it was really great listening to you. And, and I appreciate your organization, uh, you know, pushing this message that I hold very dear to myself. And I think uh, as as uh, uh, our company as well is pushing. So it, it's great to see other people doing great things like that. All right. Goodbye, everyone. See you next Thank month. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Rita. Thanks. Bye.